a lot of things that we're dealing with. Thank you, Troy. Thank uh, you. Rick. I mean, hey, my name is Rick Lujan, and I recently joined the council. I've been about uh, five to six months. Uh, the reason I joined the council is to help the community and APD join together in a common cause, which would be, you know, uh, communication, uh, camaraderie, support, and uh, to understand where our, our city is moving towards. I've uh, almost been here in Albuquerque for about 40 years. I work at Sandia National Laboratories, um, been there for 22. Um, plan to retire fairly soon. Um, recently decided to go back to school. So I'm at, uh, I'm an Aggie, right? even though I have over red on, I'm, I'm uh, an Agbo. So uh, glad to be on the council, glad to have great people on the council, glad to uh, have uh, the Northeast Heights sector uh, commanders and uh, uh, some of the police officers with us here to support you guys. Thank you, Rick. Um, Francine, my co-chair. Okay, thank you, Roy. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, my name is Francine Lopez. I'm currently a student at the University of New Mexico studying sociology and communication. Um, I have been a part of the Northeast CPC for a little over a year. Um, and the reason I joined the Northeast Community Policing Council was to help create transparency and trust uh, between the Albuquerque police and the community they serve. Uh, once again, I wanna thank everyone for being here tonight. And if anyone has any questions for our panelists or for us, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you. And um, this evening, Francine will be managing the chat. So uh, throughout the meeting, uh, we'll, we'll take a break and check the chat and she can read the questions. Uh, next up is Vicki. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Vicki Williams. Um, I've lived in Albuquerque for over 30 years. I'm a retired uh, technical project manager from Sandia Labs. Um, attended the CPA, the uh, Citizens Police Academy in 2017 and wanted to see what I could do to help APD. And so I joined the CPCs. Um, I'm going on my fifth year um, on the council. So what I'm going to be concentrating on now that I've stepped down from chair is looking at um, policies. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, James? Yep. Hi there, good evening, everybody. Um, I am new to um, our group here about three months now. Um, my name is James Santa Stephen business owner and a native of Albuquerque. And as a business owner, uh, you know, for over 30 years now, um, I've certainly seen a lot of change in our city. And I wanna make sure um, that I am a voice um, for both the law enforcement and uh, our community and just wanna be involved. Thank you. I've got a really bad, um, I'm picking something up. Are you guys picking that up too? There's some kind of uh, noise. I don't know where it's coming from. Okay, I'm gonna it's go ahead and move. Taos hum. Yeah, it's the Taos hum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank I just want to make sure it just wasn't me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kenneth. I'm uh, Kenneth Armijo. Um, I'm a, been a resident of Albuquerque for about ten years, originally from Sabinal, New Mexico. Uh, I've been on the council for about a year and a half, and like my colleagues here, uh, I've been interested in helping to bridge a, a creative bridge between the community and APD. And uh, like uh, Francine said, please put all your comments in the chat as we'd be very interested to get your input. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Willie? Hi, good evening. I'm Willie Orr. Um, I'm a mostly retired geriatrician. I uh, have been on the council for about a year um, and echo what other people have said. Um, 
Uh, we need the police have a very difficult job and we need to make sure that they and the community work well together. So I'm pleased to be on the council and pleased to be working with the people with, with whom I'm on the council with. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Uh, Cassandra? Cassandra Morrison, retired from the Albuquerque Police Department. I retired out as a field service bureau sergeant. Um, I'm just, I've been on the council since about 2018 and wanted to help build a better bridge of communication between the community and the police department. Thank you, Cassandra. And I'll uh, finish off. Um, I'm, uh, I've lived in Al Albuquerque since uh, 1977. Uh, I worked, uh, I'm a retired city employee. I uh, worked for APD for 22 years. And then I uh, retired from the city as the deputy director of the uh, Family and Community Services Department. And uh, I'm very interested in community-oriented policing and uh, doing what I can to help the uh, Albuquerque Police Department attain the uh, directives in the court-approved settlement agreement any way I can. So uh, welcome all viewers. Um, it's good to know that we have interested people attending and. Um, Please invite your friends for our next meeting uh, next month. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'll, I'll <clears throat> make a move to uh, amend or if in any amendment needs to be done, uh, but certainly to approve the uh, January meeting minutes. I'll I move, move to accept. Okay, Troy, Troy, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Thank you. Um, now, moving on, um, want to uh, approve and also amend the uh, February agenda. Um, hopefully, you've all had a chance to take a look at it. So, could I have a motion? Willie, thank you. Uh, second by Cassandra, thank you. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking Commander Weber uh, for assisting us in getting a speaker for this meeting. I'd also, uh, he, he stepped in and, and helped us out at the last minute. So thank you, uh, Commander Weber. Um, tonight we have uh, with us Commander Renee McDermott, who oversees the uh, Albuquerque Police Academy. And with her is Sergeant Hoisington um, from the Police Academy. And uh, Commander McDermott, if you are, I don't, I don't see her. I saw her. Oh, there you are. Uh, I'm sorry. Commander McDermott, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the council for inviting us tonight. Um, I've been here in Albuquerque now since August. Um, as you said, Roy, I oversee the training academy. Um, the overall structure of the academy is in, there's a lot of background noise on someone's. I think somebody might have an open mic. Everybody, uh, if you could mute um, during the presentation, I'll do so myself. Thank, thank you, that's better. I appreciate that. I kept hearing um, that. Um, so as the structure of the academy, um, we're under the superintendent of police reform. So I directly report to the superintendent. Um, with me is Deputy Commander Mike Gardner. And then I have um, the curriculum development unit, um, a career development um, lieutenant, a, a FTEP lieutenant, and an advanced um, lieutenant. In that structure are also the sergeants underneath but all of those um, components. Um, so I'm just gonna go over real high level um, what those units do or sections do. And at the end of the presentation, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, but once I'm finished, I'll kick it over to Sergeant Hoisington so he could talk about the background process um, and things of that nature. So with the curriculum development um, unit, we have a career, uh, curriculum manager who came in about the same time I did. Um, the curriculum that's created for the academy, um, we use a seven step process, which are seven sequential uh, steps. 
First is assessment of training needs, uh, development of that training, approval of the training, delivery of the training to, to the officers and, and those in the department, the operational application of the, that training in the field. And then comes the evaluation of it. And then the revision based on um, the field feedback and performance data. So the overarching goal and logic of this process is a constant improvement of, of APD's training. Um, and that's what Dr. Jessica Haney leads um, in her group in the career development um, unit. Um, we'll then move to the basic training. Um, so basic training is just that, it is of the cadets, the public service aides and our laterals. Um, so lateral officers are those that come from other departments, um, either throughout the state or outside of the state. Um, their academy um, is held and run uh, at APD. It's typically between seven and eight weeks, depending on holidays and, and things of that nature. Um, and I'll just read off a few of the, of the topics. It's not all inclusive because we would be here all night if I read everything that they did. But they, in their training, um, they do uh, use of force, obviously training, uh, all, all of the curriculum um, for the cadets, the PSAs and the laterals all cover, cover use of force, uh, taser, ethics and moral issues, um, New Mexico laws, and including constitutional policing, uh, firearms, less than lethal, uh, which are the 40 millimeter, the beanbag, um, interaction and how to deal with those that they encounter with mental illness, ethics, uh, color of law, um, obviously um, all CASA related um, topics as well. Um, then we we'll move on to, then there's the Public Service Aid Academy. Uh, they also are housed or have their training at the academy and that's a six week program. Um, and they do various types of, of components of the training that, some, that the laterals get and in the uh, cadets, they do defensive driving, um, some defensive tactics, first aid, CPR, um, overview of New Mexico uh, law and federal laws. Obviously they um, do traffic enforcement, um, their familiarization with use of force, crisis intervention, um, de-escalation. Um, and a lot of these are throughout all the curriculum. I'm just naming a few that are in, in the certain, uh, certain uh, areas. Um, then we'll go to the basic cadets. And currently we have a PSA uh, class that's uh, in session at the academy due to graduated at the end of this month. And we have a cadet class um, of 31 students currently. And we just graduated 12 uh, laterals uh, last week. So we're, uh, we're, we're getting there with the numbers and, and Jacob and Sergeant Coisington can, can talk more about that. Um, so the Cadet Academy, the basic Cadet Academy is between 26 and 28 weeks, again, depending on holidays and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, they also do defensive driving, CASA related topics, use of force, firearms, taser, everything that they need um, to have the proper tools in their, in their, uh, on their belt, right? And know how to use them and use them properly and within the law to, to protect and serve uh, the community. Um, so we have the field training um, program, which houses our FTOs. Those are the field training officers, which once the cadets, the laterals, um, PSAs graduate, they join the OJT program and they are assigned a field training officer, which they do phases of training with them on the job before they go out and are on their own. Um, and then we have the advanced training. The advanced training section does everything um, except for the basic, right? Um, they do, you know, the RBT, the reality-based training. They make sure we meet and they train all the, the CASA mandated and all the state mandated um, courses that were uh, required to um, complete yearly and, and or biannually. Um, oversee the RBT uh, facility and the range. Um, so that is a high overview of what goes on at the, at the academy. Again, 
it's not all comprehensive. We'd be here all night if I went through everything that everybody did. But um, if anybody has any questions regarding the academy right now, please ask or we can wait until after Sergeant Hoisington is, is finished. And thank you for the opportunity again, Roy and the council. I appreciate it. Roy, you're muted. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Commander McDermott. Thank you for uh, doing this on short notice and uh, thank you for being here this evening. We appreciate it. So I'll thank let you, you uh, turn it over to whoever you have with you. All right, thank <laughs> you. Um, so for the council, this is Sergeant Hoisington. He works in our background uh, department and can give you uh, insight into that process and uh, hiring goals and things of that nature. So uh, Sergeant Hoisington, the floor is yours. Thank you, Commander. So as you mentioned, I'm Sergeant Hoisington and I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Yeah, okay. So I'm the Sergeant over the backgrounds unit. Um, just a little background on myself. I've been in this position now close to 10 years. So I've been here for a while. Back when I came over, uh, about 10 years ago, I was actually over the recruiting and background unit. So it used to be one unit together. And over time, it just became such an uh, intensive portion of the department as far as recruiting and backgrounds. We really decided to separate it and have two separate units. So it's just a little background on that process. I do have a PowerPoint I have used in the past. So if you guys are okay with it, I'll just share my screen and kind of go through that. So, all right, can everybody see that? Is it up there? Okay, perfect. So the first screen, let's see. What we do, um, our primary job in backgrounds is processing for pre-employment backgrounds on cadet lateral police service aid and prisoner transport officers. So that's our primary responsibility. We will also take any referrals from the city for APD hires. So any civilian referral that um, is made towards the background unit, we will conduct those also. It is also our responsibility to process potential applicants for what we've known as cert by waiver. And what that is, is if you have an applicant that wants to lateral say from another state, um, in order to be certified in the state of New Mexico, they would have to attend a cert by waiver program. And that's put on by the Department of Public Safety. And along with that come several components that your hiring agency is responsible for to include a psychological, um, health screening and a written and comprehension exam. And that is processed through our unit as well. The initial steps in the process. So as I mentioned before, there is a recruiting unit background. We used to be one unit, but since separating. So the recruiting unit's primary job is to get potential applicants and drive them towards APD online, which is our website. And essentially what you do there is you're gonna fill out what we call an interest card. And that's just an automated questionnaire that's gonna run you through the minimum qualifications for your respective position. So your police service age, your prisoner transport officer, cadets and laterals all have job specific qualifications. They do vary between each one. And that's what the interest card's main uh, purpose is, is to qualify and disqualify applicants who are either qualified for or not qualified for their position that they're applying. If approved, so if I'm a potential applicant, I'll go in, I'll fill out an interest card. The system's gonna determine whether I meet the minimum qualifications to continue. And at that point, it'll uh, have me sign up for what we call a testing weekend. The testing weekend is a two day process. It's typically a Saturday and a Sunday. And what that entails is two written exams followed by a psychological written evaluation. And the city entrance exam is the first test that is administered. And it's a pass or fail. You need at least a 70% to pass, 100 questions, multiple choice. We score it that day immediately. And the individuals that pass, they continue on to the next 
exam and the individuals that do not, they'll speak to myself or one of my background detectives and they'll give them information on how they can reapply and come back and redo that portion. If they pass the city entrance, they'll move on to the second test, which is the Nelson Denny. And this is a vocabulary reading and comprehension exam. Again, this is a pass or fail. And essentially what this is looking for is uh, 10th grade reading and comprehension level. Applicants that pass that portion will then move on to the Sunday testing, which is a written psychological. This is not a pass or fail. So essentially what this is, it's administered by the behavioral science division. And so we just facilitate and um, offer up the building to them. She'll come in and she'll administer the written psychological. This is scored separately at a later time and it's used in correlation with the interview that they'll have with the doctor later on in the process when they go to the psychological. Upon completion of the testing weekend, so all the individuals that pass the selection for the testing weekend, they are instructed to provide several documentations several documents, one of them being a personal history statement, which is essentially the resume. It's going to ask them several questions about drug use, criminal history, financial history, employment, reference checks, all the stuff that we need in order to complete a background um, on them for their position. That leads us into the actual background itself. So the applicants are gonna provide all the information. All that information gets compiled and put into a respective file for the applicant. The files go to myself and then I assign them out to background investigators. Background investigation, as you can see here, it's gonna be comprised of your criminal history, reference, employment. They will be scheduled for a polygraph, uh, psychological, chief selection, medical and physical assessment. So these are all mandatory components of the background investigation itself. Hiring guidelines. So I'm gonna back up actually here, kind of walk through a little bit of each of these. So the polygraph itself is administered in correlation with the background. So if I'm an applicant, I pass my testing weekend. The next step is I'm gonna get a call from a background investigator. They'll reach out to me and they'll bring me in for an, for an interview. What the background detective's gonna do is they're gonna go over the personal history statement with the applicant to ensure all the information they provided is accurate and that they don't need to make any changes prior to going to a polygraph. If everything looks good, there's no disqualifying information that comes up during that interview, they'll schedule them for a polygraph and those are done with a contracted polygrapher. So we don't have any in-house, we actually contract out for the polygraphers. They'll go to the polygraph and then the polygrapher will um, make a report. That report comes to myself and then I provide that to our detectives. The detectives review the information and if there's any confusion or varying information, the detective will reach out to the applicant and kind of decipher what's going on with that information. If everything looks good, they'll move them along in the process. And actually the next step in the process would be the chief selection. Chief selection is an oral interview with our command staff. And what they'll do is they'll bring the applicant in. Um, and first they'll start with the background detective. We're gonna summarize the applicant, provide that panel with all the information in their background that they've discovered. And then they'll bring the applicant in and the panel will ask them questions regarding their background of any concerns or issues that they may or have. Chief selection will make a recommendation for that individual to either move along in the process or they'll recommend that they be removed for whatever reasons may have come up in that interview. If they are re recommended to continue in the process, then they're gonna go on to their psychological evaluation and the medical. Both of these are a mandatory pass. There is a appeal process for the psychological because it is governed by the Department of Public Safety. They do have an appeal process that the applicant can look into if they so choose, but it's at the cost of the applicant and it has to be approved through DPS in order for them to see another doctor and have another interview. And the applicants are provided with all that information at that time if they're not recommended for certification. Medical is again, enough, must be a pass. Um, these are all governed by DPS. And then the last step is a physical assessment. So there is a mandatory physical assessment. Again, these are minimum requirements that are set forth by the Department of Public Safety, so they must pass. 
So long as they pass all these steps, um, they'll actually move on to what we call new employee orientation, and that's their first day of hire. And then upon completion of that, that's just a one day orientation where they get signed up for benefits and they go through the city process for hire. And then on the second day, they would report to the academy for their training. Hiring guidelines. So these are kind of the, um, what kind of drives the backgrounds. Uh, the Department of Public Safety, for one, they establish all the minimum guidelines for hires, law enforcement officers in the state as well as the New Mexico Administrative Code. So these set forth all standards for law enforcement agencies in the state of New Mexico. So these are the minimum standards and like our PT assessment, these are the standards that they set. Departments across the state, they can go higher than the minimum standards, you just can't go lower. And what I mean like, and what I mean by that, and I'll give you an example is drug use. So I don't know if you're aware, but there's, if you look at different agencies across the state, you may see that they vary as far as minimum requirements for each agency. That's because there is a minimum standard that DPS has, and then you can always go above it. So currently APD has a two-year minimum for marijuana, whereas you may see for other agencies like Santa Fe County, I don't think they have a marijuana uh, minimum requirement. And so those can be set by each hiring agency to the threshold that they see fit. The cost of the settlement agreement, paragraphs 232 to 240 are the ones that directly relate in regards to the backgrounds and our standard operating procedure. So those are the, the guidelines that we operate primarily under as far as completing backgrounds because they assure what processes that we need to follow. And I think, uh, lastly, these are just some who we, uh, utilize our resources with and doing backgrounds. So employee health or contracted to Concentra, we utilize them for our medicals. Of course, our director of training over at the academy who essentially oversees all the hiring for cadets. Department of Public Safety or Department of Public Safety touched on them. Our HR department. So once they are through our process of backgrounds, we have to coordinate with HR for their hire. Behavioral science conducts all of the psychologicals. Our crime lab ID unit, they actually help with our criminal history checks because they have access to several databases and we utilize them because they can streamline that process for us. PGP polygraph is our contracted polygrapher and real-time solutions is our contracted vendor for APD online. So they can make any kind of changes that we need to our website and our processing system whenever those things do come up. I think that is the end of my slides. So, all right, do you guys have any questions? Um, yeah, thank you, Commander Hoisen, or uh, Sergeant Hoisington. Um, just wanna let you know, I uh, worked with your father and uh, I'm happy to see that you're uh, moving up the ranks. I appreciate that. Haven't been moving for a while. I've been here for 10 years, but oh, hopefully okay. soon. Hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, questions in the chat. <clears throat> so Francine, if you want to start ticking those off and uh, uh, either Commander McDermott or Sergeant Hoisington, if, I'll let you decide uh, which one of you want to answer the questions. They're kind of varied. So Francine. Hey, thanks, Roy. Um, so the first question is from uh, Logie Mathis, um, and their question is, does APD still run a high stress academy? Okay. Um, yes, uh, the academy is very uh, stringent, very strict. Um, like I said, it's between 28 and 26 weeks. Um, they are brought there and um, essentially start out the morning, their first morning at uh, 5 a.m. in a boot camp type, uh, if you can envision that, um, uh, lineup. Um, and the physical fitness, the academics, um, the physical training, um, they are, it is a high stress environment for them. Um, 
given um, a majority of their backgrounds and, and their age and where they came from. This for most of them has been their first, you know, type of, you know, possibly full-time job. Um, but it is a very high stress and um, very rigorous academy. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next question is from Roger and his question is, where is the academy physically located? Are the facilities okay? Um, the academy is physically located at near the intersection of 2nd Street and Montano, um, right by the city church and where the crime lab is located and um, the substation. So we're right in, in the middle there. Um, yeah, we have a gym, we have classrooms, um, we have the background um, units uh, housed out there. We have a leadership lab. Um, so yeah, the uh, of course, everybody's always gonna say we could use more and have different things, but um, for what we do and the other facilities that, that we use and our, and our track is there, um, it uh, suits the needs for the training that the cadets receive and the PSAs and the laterals. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Karen um, and her statement says, I live in the, I live in uh, the North Valley, but I'm attending tonight's uh, Northeast CPC meeting because we hike up in uh, Sandia Foothills. I'm trying to learn more about the areas I like to spend time in. Um, so the question is, what are the top three concerns the Northeast area citizens seem to be most concerned about? Um, that question maybe we uh, could save for uh, Commander uh, Weber. Okay, perfect. So the next question is from Amina, and the question is, does the recruiting unit seek out minority women to recruit for positions in the department? So, yes, as far as I know minorities go, the recruiting unit does have substantial recruitment efforts. I can't tell you exactly what they are because um, I don't oversee recruiting anymore but I, it would be easily attainable and I could probably send you something from the Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Silva on their recruitment plan and everything it entails. And I could just forward that off to you all if you guys were interested in something like that. Yeah, that'd be great. That would be great. All right, uh, the next question is from Matthew and uh, their question is, that, is the Academy pass or fail? Yeah, you, um, yes, you must pass um, the required uh, testing, uh, firearms qualifications, uh, physical fitness qualifications, uh, standards, um, and academically. Yes, so it's not pass fail. You must pass in order to, uh, you know, become an officer and, um, and be sworn. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Mike and Terry. Um, and their question is, what is the hurdle you find the most difficult for candidates to pass? So you get a variance. As far as the background itself, the biggest thing that we come across is dishonesty and minimization of issues that they may have had in their background prior to. And so you get a lot of applicants who are worried that transgressions in their past may disqualify them. So they either don't disclose it or they minimize it. And eventually it comes out later on and it puts them in a negative light that they're being dishonest, which, you know, entering a career in law enforcement is a big red flag. And that's what we see as far as issues in the background itself. And then you have the hurdles of, you know, requirements that you must pass that aren't background related. And those are like your written tests. So you'll see people struggle in passing the city entrance or the Nelson Denny. Um, separate of that, you'll see a lot of people struggle in the physical fitness area. And so with one of the last classes that we held, I think we had, because the physical fitness portion is one of the last portions of the hiring process, um, where we run into issue is you invest all this time, money and effort in processing an applicant 
um, you send them through the medical, the psychological, the polygraph, all of these components come with a cost because they are contracted out just to see them end up failing the physical fitness two weeks prior to the start of the academy. And so, you know, trying to, you're trying a tight rope act because you want applicants to apply. And so you don't want to discourage it, but you want them to show results on the PT as they're going through the process because, you know, this is a mandatory portion. So if you see people struggling and you bring them in, so what we'll do is we'll bring in, you know, applicants that are in the background process and say, hey, we're going to run you through a mock assessment just to ensure that you guys are on the right path. So we know that we're investing our time, money, and effort into potential applicants to be seated. And so you'll see people struggle, but, you know, if they're making strides to improve, hopefully that they'll put forth their best effort to pass at the tail end. But without fail, you know, we have a handful of individuals who just don't make it. And so those are the struggles that we have because it's, it's such a um, complex background. It's not like any other background that you would see applying for any other position because of so many requirements and so many different components to include like the educational portion, the psychological portion, the honesty or the, your, your past, you know, potentially being an issue and then going to achieve selection in the physical fitness. So there's so many variances within a background, but those are the ones that you'll see where you'll see the biggest um, drop off between passes and fails. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Willie, um, and he is asking if uh, checking social media posts um, are part of the process. It is. We do check social media as part of the background, and it can disqualify you if we find issues of um, inappropriate comments. You know, we get a lot of racism, things that, like that that come up, and they do disqualify. Okay, um, the next question is from Amina, and their question is, there any one area that, if not passed, would eliminate the candidate for consideration? Yes, several. So one thing I learned about backgrounds, when I first came into this position, I was new to it, and I didn't have a firm grasp on the variance of background issues that there are potentially. I wanted to come in with a black or white process for removal. So my thought was everybody is gonna be the same. If you do this, you're getting disqualified for a certain amount of time. It's gonna be uniform across the board. Over time, I realized that's not, that's not the case, not even close because everybody's situations are so different and different factors of different people's lives and time that's passed between issues. You can't, you can't just paint a broad brush over it and kind of keep everybody in the same. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have applicants who apply and then you find out through their employment that they've been recently terminated. Um, so, okay, so that's an issue. So you talk to their employer, you find out the reasons that they were terminated. You know, it's a red flag, you were terminated. Um, but you find out that the reason they were terminated, I'm trying to not give specifics, but give you a good example. Um, we had an individual who was using a lot of sick leave and um, was failing to show up to work, but then you find out that he was having issues with medical issues and financial issues. And so you look at that case individually and you look at his prior employment, but you find out that he was a good employee prior to all these issues coming up. So those are the kind of things you look at individually and you want to um, evaluate them case by case as they come up. And then when you get into drug use, you know, you have your minimum qualifications for entry, but then you're going to have a lot of variance prior to that. And usage is a big thing. So if you have our minimum qualification for a felony drug is five years, it's two years for misdemeanor drug. So that's a minimum. You got to have at least that time between applying. But Prior to that, so that's that's going to get you past the interest card. That'll get you in the backgrounds. And that's all that we can ask at the interest card level. You can't, without having a conditional offer in place, you can't go past that and ask more information without having a conditional offer. So until they're in backgrounds, you can't ask for more information about drug use. 
So there's a big gap there. You may, you, we know that you haven't used in the last five and two for those years if you answered yes, but we don't know how many times. And so that's where the, the variance is gonna come in individually. You're gonna have applicants that say, okay, when I was in high school, I used cocaine three to four times. That was 10 years ago. Okay, so you evaluate that case by case. They haven't done anything since, but then you have other individuals who have used marijuana daily for the last six years. And even though it's a misdemeanor drug, you look at how many times they've used it and how long they used it. And that can determine their eligibility and how long it takes for them to come back and reapply. So I, I'm kind of going long winded into this. I think uh, what to take from it is that everyone's are different. So you kind of take it on a case by case. And our background process isn't just me making a decision on every single applicant. It's a three tiered process because one thing I also learned about this was that, you know, your, your own personal experiences with things in your life kind of skew how you feel about things. And that may be different for somebody else that have, doesn't have that same exposure. And I had this debate with somebody when I first got there and it, and it kind of relates to what your experience is in life where we had an applicant who had contributing to a delinquency of mine. And so they provided alcohol to somebody that was underage, which is a felony, okay? Her firm line was that it's a felony, you should be disqualified, you know, it is what it is. And I was like, well, if you look at the circumstances, there's been a lot of time in between. So we had differing opinions about it. And that's, you know, my experience in life growing up, I had had been around issues of similar, so my view towards it may was a little different than what hers was where she didn't have that experience and she was had different life experiences regarding something similar and so we had different variances and so what i see and what i love about our evaluation process is it's a three-tiered process where you know it goes to the sergeant level if he approves it it goes to the next lieutenant they have to approve it and if not it goes to the commander and all three levels have to agree in order to remove somebody from the process. And it falls upon the commander at that point to make the final decision and termination of where that applicant status is. I think that should cover that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Diana and her question is, what is the cost and are there opportunities for financial aid? So the cost to attend Academy or the cost for background, I guess. So there's no cost to attend the academy itself. It's fully funded. You're actually employed. You're an employee of the city, so you're being paid. The costs of the background um, are of no cost to the applicant either. So the city pays for all the exams, the polygraph, the detective's time. So there's no cost to the applicant either way. Okay, um, the next question is from Karen, um, and she is asking, are the background investigators sworn officers? So it's a mixture of both sworn and civilian. So currently, I have two sworn. Way back when, when we first started, it was all sworn. Um, just in the times that we are, it's hard to have all sworn officers or justify having sworn officers just do backgrounds. And so we have two full-time sworn. Uh, the rest are contracted employees. However, all contracted employees are former law enforcement officers, so they all were former APD officers. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Jack, um, and he is asking, were there any minority females in the laterals class that recently graduated or in the upcoming classes? Yes, I don't know how many. I'm just going off what I recall from the roster. A lot of Hispanic females, but those are easily attainable. I can get um, a demographic breakdown from recruiting or even my background roster should have that information. I can send that over to you if you like. <laughs> That'd be great. Yes, um, the next question is um, from Diana. Um, and she is asking how many continued education and training hours are required a year? Does it vary depending on rank? So um, the simple answer is yes, annual and biannual training um, includes 40 hours of continu continuing education for officers. Um, 
you know, by rank, um, we have supervisory, um, 32 hours of supervisor training that is also offered um, throughout the year. There's a two week detective academy um, and those are tailored to, those are just to name a few, those are tailored obviously to um, the detectives and or the supervisors during the supervisor training, you know, they learn things such as, you know, performance, how to document performance uh, deficiencies, how to help um, create a plan to help officers succeed and, and lead them through what uh, success looks like uh, to get them where they need to be. Um, but the answer to the overall the first part of the question was there are 40 hours of continuing education um, each year for the officers. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what percentage of those who pass the initial weekend testing don't graduate? Um, well, it's hard to say. So the testing weekend is such an early step of the process to track between that and graduation would be difficult. Um, I would say probably a more accurate number would be what percentage past the testing weekend actually start the academy. Um, I would have to say, and this is just going off the top of my head, I would estimate for every hundred that you go to backgrounds, you're going to see about 30 of those be hired. So you probably have about a 70% removal you know, maybe maybe 60 40 somewhere right around there between making it to backgrounds and actually start and that's just taking in all of the variances that we talked about earlier okay uh, the next question is from troy and he is asking how is recruiting affected by the allowance of recreational drugs is the recruiting requirement less or still strict and how is that affecting potential recruits so our requirement hasn't changed. So it still is at the two years. So we haven't we haven't seen. It's hard to to say if we've been affected by it. Um, I haven't seen a steep increase in marijuana removals, um, but we would have to look. We'd have to break it down to see how many people have applied and were disqualified for drugs prior to it. Um, being made legal and then comparing that to what numbers we have post it being legal to see kind of if we have an increase in there, but um, I don't have that information off hand. Okay, thank you. The next question is, are applicants able to reapply if they fail once? If able, do they have to wait a certain amount of time? Yes to both. So our SOP does have parameters for reapplying, but it depends on what your reason for failure was. So if you fail one of the written portions, for example, you are afforded the opportunity to reapply at least one more time um, within a testing cycle. So if I come in, I test, I don't pass the Nelson Denny, I can reapply for that same testing cycle, take it again. If I don't pass that second time, I'll have to wait six months before reapplying. And those are the same rules that apply to the city entrance. The background itself, when you get into the background, those disqualifications um, are case by case, like we spoke about. So if somebody you see has a pattern of, um, they're, they're kind of like a gypsy cop, for example. You see them bouncing around agency to agency. They stick around for five months and then they're reapplying somewhere else. And so you have a pattern of behavior there where you're worried that, okay, they're just coming here for the hiring incentive or, you know, they just want to get the money. They may, they may not be the best applicant. So a stipulation you may apply to their background before reapplying is we want to see some stability in your employment before reapplying. So establish employment for two years. So we know that this isn't something that we are going to see from you with us and then come back and reapply in two years and we can reevaluate. So you'll see the variance there. Some people are just deemed ineligible. Um, you'll get applicants that have just made too many poor decisions or they have a pattern or they disclose just information that's criminal in nature. And so they're deemed ineligible. It's rare, but it does happen. But I would say 
on average, people that get disqualified for background issues, you're probably looking at one to three years eligibility based off the issue, sometimes six months, depending on what comes up. Okay, uh, the next question is from James. Um, and his question is, when an applicant applies, what's the turnaround time for contact and get for contact and to get in the process. I understand many apply but don't respond when reaching back out. Is it because it's it takes too long to respond? No, so the the way the system's set up, so APD online, a lot of it's automated and it gives the applicants um, a lot of leeway in scheduling their own application. So what that means is I go in APD online, I apply. It's up to me to pick any test date that I want to come. By. So currently, I think we're testing out through July. So you can select any testing that you want to come by, as long as you're qualified. And you have the ability to log in, change your testing anytime that you want. It just has to be done prior 24 hours before testing because we have to lock in at that point. So they do have a lot of ability. They can withdraw, they can reapply, they can select other positions. When you get into the background stage, that is dependent upon caseload at the time. What that means is um, human nature. So for example, we have a currently, we're recruiting for a cadet class that starts in May with timelines and deadlines that are established by DPS. Even though we have a May start date, our recruiting cycle is gonna end in March. That's just because we have deadlines that we have to submit our paperwork to DPS. So we can't be running recruiting cycles into May because we have to have that paperwork, the medicals and all that stuff to DPS. So you essentially start going backwards from there. So we, we end our recruiting cycle in March. Human nature is for people to remove their applications and what they do is they keep pushing their test dates back, pushing their test dates back, pushing their test dates back. And so what we commonly see is a backlog because we'll get several applicants who apply towards that last testing weekend and we'll see an influx of applicants applying. So if we are to get a backlog, that's where it is. And the disconnect that, the only disconnect that you get between an applicant passing a testing weekend and being contacted is being assigned to a background detective. Once they're assigned a background detective, that initial phone call, the first thing they do is they give them all their information, their contact information. So if the applicant has any questions about their process, the background detective is the one they need to reach out to because they're the ones that are and have all their information. They're gonna have all their test scores, the results, polygraph and whatnot. But what we typically see is uh, they'll go, they'll test and they haven't been assigned to a background detective. And so they don't have that direct line. So maybe they'll reach out to a recruiting officer but the recruiting officer is not gonna know any details because it's all confidential and it's only the background detective and myself that's gonna have that information. So what we do is um, I provide them with my contact information. So I give them my email and my phone number. They're provided with that. So if they have any questions during that downtime between being assigned a background detective and passing the testing weekend, they at least have someone they can reach out to so they can be reassured that they haven't been eliminated or are still in the process. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Karen. Um, and her question is, are you encouraged by the number of persons applying to become police officers? Um, we could use more. Um, I think we all know the news, you know, we're down on numbers. So I would be much enthused to see those numbers climbing up, but you know, we're making do with what we have. Okay, um, the next question is from Vicki um, and she is asking, how do you train to the policies that are continually changing and being updated like use of force? Right, so um, when I first started out, I talked about that seven step process. Um, so through that process, revision of training is based on data we get from the field, trends we're seeing, um, things of that nature. Um, we'll tailor um, 
you know, in our reality-based training center, if there are gaps in training needs that we've identified throughout the year, or if the field from DC Brown and his commanders from the field and, and things they need from us, we in turn then will, if it's an immediate change to a policy regarding that training, we will do a video with supplemental um, uh, training in that format, um, possibly back at RBT. Um, obviously there's, there's remedial training that may have to occur at times um, for various reasons. Um, and also the um, department will put out special orders as well, highlighting a change in a current policy and what that means um, to the officers and the way forward. Um, that answer your question specifically, Vicki? Well, um, I guess what I was asking was, I've been um, attending the policy and procedures unit meeting. And I mean, we're looking at, you know, five to seven policies on a daily basis. And those policies are being updated and changed and wording to, you know, the officer will to the officer shall. And so how do those subtle changes to the SOPs, you know, make it down to the officers so that they, that they know that there's, you know, major changes? Right, they will, they will come out in special orders um, to the department okay. um, that are immediate and also through additional training videos that um, our, my advanced uh, sergeant um, or, or lieutenant will, will um, provide as well as an immediate um, correction, course correction, and for their awareness, obviously, right? Um, to know that, that there has been that change. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, so the next question is from Willie and he is asking if the Civilian Police Academy um, is run out of the academy. Yes, it is. Um, we are getting ready to host um, the spring session um, sometime in March. And O'Kelly, I believe I told you the 1st of March, I told uh, Lieutenant Garcia the end of March, we're uh, right now going through that process. So it will be sometime um, closer to the end of March, which will be our spring session. And then again in the fall, but it is held um, at the training academy. Uh, I don't wanna hijack the conversation of Commander McDermott, but do we know if we're gonna have an abbreviated academy also like we had last time? And also um, will there be any online classes or will it all be in person? Um, as far as the plan is now, it will be in person um, in regarding abbreviated classes. What um, or is that in reference to? Well, we had a shorter class last time rather than the normal three months. Uh, I think it was 12, 12 nights or something like that. And I, I believe a couple of the CPC are signed up for that. Um. Uh, I would have to get back to you on abbreviated okay. um, classes, but I know for this one coming up, it will start sometime in March. So sorry I about that. I'll get I'll get you I'll get you an answer though um, for sure. I'll email you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Commander McDermott, prior to your coming on board, what we did was um, we felt like there was like a, a major impediment for people that wanted to join the CPC to attend the you know, the three month, two nights a week, three hours each night. And so we put together, a, a, based on the syllabus, we put together um, a listing of classes that we felt like the CPC should take um, in the CPA, not necessarily every single class. So I don't know if that's what Kelly means by an abbreviated one, um, but, you know, maybe yeah. you can check with the with the previous individual. There is there is a list that we said we would like all members of the CPC to take these classes, whether they're online, in person, or whatever. That's just kind oh, of a little bit of okay. the history. I understand now. Yes, I believe like if you would sign up 
say a new member would sign up for this session, right? And we would accept them into the March session. That abbreviated course topics that you want them to listen to or be a part of, right, uh, yes. in person, they could go to those um, as opposed to the 12 week, two nights a yes. week. So I understand exactly what yes. you're asking. Yes, those modifications um, are made. Of course, we'd like you to attend the entire thing, but we know how very time consuming that is. But, but um, it's very beneficial as well. Um, either way, if you could come for the entire one or the abbreviated, because we know everybody's time is important. So right. thank you. Now that's, I have a better understanding of what you were asking. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, excuse Willie. me. How, yeah, how do we sign up? Now, what's the process for that? Um, you can email me and I will be able to get you in touch with the Lou, uh, Lieutenant um, over that, um, the CPC, CPA, um, and we, we can uh, organize it that way. Thank you. That is one way. Um, or everyone could just send me their information and I can send one list over as soon as we have uh, the information handy from CPC. Uh, that would be going. perfect. I just caution, um, there are only so many spots. So um, we offer two a, a year. Um, so I just said, not everybody that signs up can always attend the, the first time. Uh, depends on uh, how many are already selected for the class. So just, I wanna set everybody's expectations that um, you will get in. It may just not be this first session that you apply for. So hopefully everybody understands that. Um, up front. Thanks for that understanding. Okay, so we just have a few more questions. Um, so the next question is asking um, if recruiting is keeping up with the numbers of retirements. Um, good question. So I don't know what our current sworn number is. So I wouldn't be able to tell you. You know, our, our goal every year is to at least bring on 100 officers. We don't always meet that goal. I think last year, I don't know, Commander, if you remember, it was close to around 80, to sound about right, that we brought on. Um, so without knowing what the actual attrition rate is, it's, it's difficult um, with the way PARA is in a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the para and the way it works. So with the 20 year versus the 25 year. So a lot of the people that you're seeing retire are still under the 20 year para program. I being one of them. So you see a lot of officers who can leave at 20 years and you can subtract your time from that military time. So you can see employees that essentially leave close to 18 years on if they buy a year back and then if they have PSA time. So for example, I was a PSA, so I was two years in. And so a lot of those things you have to take into account and where we're currently at as far as the retirements go. And I think it was 2012 when they changed it somewhere around there where they changed that plan from 20 to 25. And so as long as we're operating in those individuals that are eligible to leave at the 20 year mark, it's going to be very difficult to keep up uh, with attrition because it's not until you see those other individuals at the 25 year mark that if they do stay with the department that you're going to see at least three to four more years from them. And so, you know, recruiting is really your only way to really boost those numbers. So um, without knowing what those numbers exactly are, you know, you'd look at where we are currently sworn with where we were a few years ago, and you can kind of figure out where we are with the attrition versus recruiting. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Matthew is asking if officers are allowed to request training based on issues they see in the community. Um, yeah, Matthew, um, obviously again, back to very similar to my response that I gave to Vicki um, and, when there are trends and things that officers are seeing in the field um, that they need, training is revised. Um, 
and we will make those accommodations to, to get that incorporated, um, what they're seeing or what they, they need. Um, in addition to, there's always opportunities through, you know, the in, International Chiefs of Police, the IACP, and other various um, departments in the state, um, and other avenues that they can always request to go to auxiliary training being paid for and supported by the department um, in, in other uh, states, cities, um, given by other departments. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is from Diana. Um, and she is asking how many continued education and training hours are required a year and does it vary depending on rank? So Francine, I believe I answered that earlier. It was the 40 hours of continued um, training education annually, biannually. Um, and I mentioned the Detective Academy is a specific academy that's two weeks long. Um, and the supervisor training that is 32 hours. Um, in duration where they learn specific, um, you know, uh, information policies, um, things that they need in order to um, do, their, do their jobs. For example, in the supervisor training, um, the performance evaluation um, is, is big um, in the supervisor training, uh, given they know how to document deficiencies, how to also document uh, performance improvement plans and, and, and work with the officers to, to get them where they need. Um, so I think that was a repeat question. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And um, that's all the questions for now, Roy. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, um, starting with the Nelson Denny, uh, I way back in the in the day um, when they started using the Nelson Denny, um, I believe I remember the average. Uh, reading level uh, at that time was uh, like the sophomore year in high school. Uh, do you have any information on um, what levels uh, the types of cadets you're getting in now, uh, where they stand in terms of the Nelson Denny? I mean, what do you mean by as far as what they're getting now? Are you talking about in the academy as far as what kind well, of when they after they take the Nelson Denny test, you know the results. Do you keep? Do you all are you all able to keep aggregate uh, statistics? Uh, you know to compare uh, from say one class to the next how uh, how people are doing in general on that particular testing instrument. It's funny you bring that up because we actually just kind of did this whole evaluation of our written exams to include the city entrance. And so the Nelson Denny is an instrument that, you know, it's reading and comprehension, but it's also utilized as part of the evaluation for the psychological. So our, one of our contracted doctors, Pete DeVosto, and I didn't know this, um, he was one of the proponents that pushed the 10th grade reading and comprehension. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that the state actually doesn't require a passing score of the Nelson Denny. You just have to administer one. And so with that information, this was, you know, he did a lot of research on it and was talking with other academies, they felt based off, you know, our demographics here that that was the applicable baseline to move forward in the process to be successful as a law enforcement officer as a career moving forward. And so that's kind of what that stands for. Okay, so oh, um, it's it's good. Uh, so you're still working with Dr. DeVos, so, uh, Yeah, <laughs> well, he still yeah, does our uh, pre-employment interviews. So he's yeah, one of I, our contracted doctors. That's a blast from the past for me. I, I worked with him as well. Um, um, one other, uh, another question. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, do you have a targeted number of lateral uh, recruits that you uh, set for every year? Do you, do you try to go after, you know, some X number of uh, laterals? Uh, the reason I ask is it, it seems that, you know, uh, getting a lateral recruit uh, would take less time. Uh, 
considering that they've been trained or that's my assumption um, is is there do you have a, a set number that you try to uh, attract every year set number. so we're constantly recruitment is 24 7 365 so there's no set limit on any position currently of course budget comes into play but because of where our numbers are we're we can hire going on in the future for probably in the next decade. Um, I don't know if you're aware, so the department does offer incentive pay for PSA recruit and lateral. And so that's kind of an, an indication of where they're probably, they think the same way that you're thinking. So laterals are offered more incentive pay because of the exact reason you mentioned is that there's a higher turnaround to get them from higher to the field because they are certified, their lateral academy is shorter. And so the turnaround is quicker to get them out taking calls to any service. Um, the problem you look into, the problem we run into hiring laterals is, you know, when we had, when they, when they came in with a new contract a few years ago, you saw a large increase in laterals because the base pay was so much more substantial than other law enforcement agencies across the state. So you, if you look at the recruiting numbers, you'll see a large influx in our lateral interest as well as, well as our lateral hires. Um, that's kind of tapered down. Everybody's kind of in the same area now as far as base pay with the exception of longevity. So of course you look at longevity. And so those are all things that our recruiters will talk about with the applicant, which does weigh heavily in their decision. Um, but a lot of the applicants that we do get are ones that are um, either problem children at their current agency, they're you know, under a current investigation for internal affairs, for what do you support, you name it, you know. They resign in lieu of termination. So you do save a lot of time on the training, but their backgrounds are far more intensive and do take a lot more time because you have to do so much more research into their previous employment, reaching internal affairs. And the Department of Justice realized that as well, because if you look through our paragraphs, you'll see that it's highly stipulated towards laterals and what we will continue to do as far as polygraphs, looking into their use of force, history, criminal complaints or citizen complaints, uh, lawsuits and whatnot. So the Department of Justice also recognizes that that is a potential issue if you just start hiring laterals and just taking them because you know the high turnaround, you gotta have to keep that in the back of your mind that you still have to do your due diligence and weeding out the ones that don't belong there. Thank you, thank you. Um, and one final question, um, and I'm just kind of looking for a ballpark um, uh, figure, but roughly speaking, how long from uh, beginning to end, um, from recruiting the very first stage of uh, recruiting until a cadet graduates from the academy, uh, do you have a figure for how, how long that, that takes? Well, the academy, what do we say? Was Six months, Commander. So we add that on top. I would say the average background process, you're probably looking, well, that's hard to say. So we, because we operate around recruiting cycles, if somebody, this recruiting, can you guys hear that dog in the background? I'm sorry. Do you hear it yapping? Okay. Give me one second while I go yell at you. Um, while uh, Commander McDermott, while uh, Sergeant Poisington's away, well, he's just returned. Uh, Saved by the bell. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so this, there's background story. To this. So let's say our recruiting cycle for this May class started in October. So an applicant that applied in October, you know, and they start in May, you're looking at, what is that? five months, six months, seven months, maybe, that you're saying, oh, well, this guy was in the background process for. Well, that's not necessarily the case. They may have been processed for and passed within four weeks, but because their physical assessment portion has to be ran two weeks prior to the start, 
they technically didn't pass the entire process until they met that last step. So what the department does is they realize that that's an issue. So they do offer what's called pre-hire employment because you don't want to lose potential applicants with the delay between somebody that applied in October and can't start until May. So as long as you pass all of the components of the background, what I would do is I would bring them in for a physical assessment to make sure that they're in line with passing come May. We would hire them. They would be assigned somewhere administratively in the department up until the start of the academy, and then they would transfer over into that position once that academy starts. To answer your question, I would say on average, you're looking like your typical applicant that's in their mid-20s, doesn't have substantial life experience and employment, you're probably looking about two months for background. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do uh, any of the council members have uh, any specific, specific uh, questions that have not been put in the chat? Okay, well, Commander McDermott and Sergeant Hoisington, thank you very much for a very, very, very informative uh, presentation, especially considering the short notice that we threw at you. And I, I apologize for that, but thank you very much for coming through. And uh, I, we all really appreciate your presentation. Thank you, uh, Roy. We really appreciate having the opportunity and thank you for the questions. Um, and if there's anything ever on anyone's mind, please feel free to, to call or email me, uh, you know, and to talk, talk more about it. So thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Okay, moving, moving along on the agenda. Um, it's time for uh, Commander Weber. Good evening. And How's everybody? And Quite a presentation. Um, I appreciate Commander McDermott and Sergeant Hoisington um, stepping in at the last second to sort of give us uh, an agenda for tonight. So much, much thanks to them. And it was very informative. I hope that everybody got what they were looking for out of that presentation. Uh, I thought it was very, very informative. Um, for before, us, before you get too far in, I, I want to uh, publicly thank you, Commander Weber, for helping us to get this uh, presentation turned around so quickly. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your help. Um, well, I, yeah, I don't deserve it. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> Commander McDermott really just kind of stepped up right away and said, yes, I'll do it. So, uh, but I was happy to facilitate. Um, so for us, uh, for our updates, we'll I'll have uh, Sergeant Sims do the numbers in a minute. We, um, I gave the presentation last month on our engagement strategy, and I did get a lot of requests about it. Um, so I did have them post it to our Northeast Area Command website. So if anybody is still looking for that, it is on the website, as well as the information from the ACS, uh, their latest presentation, so that if people have questions about that, they can certainly go there to get that information. And then the other thing I was going to mention is the the newsletter should be coming out, which thank you, um, Francine, for the update and, and Roy for, for uh, getting us uh, something from the CPC. So that that is in the newsletter and we're looking to put that out. Um, and then starting next month, the newsletter will, will have events in it again. We, we haven't had events the last two newsletters. I've, we're starting a new bid here uh, on Saturday. Uh, the officers got shuffled around. We went to 12 hour shift to sort of more efficiently use the resources that we have left. Um, so because of that switch, I have several new supervisors and really just don't have, um, they haven't started working here yet. They'll start on Saturday. And so I really can't give any information on where they might be or, or where they're gonna brief, but we will have cop on the corner advertisements uh, in the next newsletter. We'll have some other events going on. And I'm also happy to announce we did just finish the hiring process for our crime prevention specialist. So she is starting um, Saturday and we'll, we'll have her at the next meeting as well. So some changes for us here in the Northeast. Um, I'll answer any, you know, obviously uh, the usual questions that come about for the command, um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Sergeant Sims whenever you're ready for the uh, numbers. Well, one, one thing that came up in the 
questions. Uh, if I can paraphrase it, uh, a person was asking, uh, they live in the valley, uh, but they hike up in the Northeast Heights area and they wanted to know if there were any areas of particular concern. Uh, I'm guessing maybe in the Foothills area, I, I don't know for sure, but up in the Northeast Heights. Um, yeah, I, I did hear that question. Yeah, it's kind of that they're, um, if you live in the North Valley, west of I-25, um, then they're not in my command. Right. Um, if you're talking about hiking, most of the hiking is up in the foothills <laughs> area yeah. command. So you're kind of kind of skipping over us, but in general, obviously the biggest concerns in the Northeast, um, it's kind of divided into two different area commands. On the South side, I have I have one set of issues and then on the north side, I have a different set of issues. And I would say on the, the north side, it, traffic and aggressive driving continue to be one of the largest challenges for us on the north side, um, along with the modified exhausts and uh, drag racing. And then um, I, I would say the other issue that we get quite a bit of now is we're just, you know, the, um, the encampment issue is the city has a whole set of resources dedicated to that, which the police department is a part of. Um, but it, it continues to be a challenge for us in the city that the number of people just sort of setting up shop in random locations uh, in my, at least in my perception continues to grow. So um, those are kind of the concerns on the north side of town. Okay, and um, uh, we have a, a question that we're gonna ask uh, at some point, uh, Kelly. Um, uh, so I, I think maybe after APD does their presentation, we can, uh, um, put up our question uh, for our viewers. So uh, word out to all the viewers, uh, please uh, stay with us so you can participate in our survey. So back to you, Commander Weber. So I had a question for Commander Weber, a, a policy question. Um, so there are, I'm, I'm trying to get into kind of policies in general. And I understand that there's like over 200 policies and they're specific for officers on how to do their job. And so I'm wondering how an individual officer um, uses his discretion when he is dealing with a service call um, we've, we've talked in the, in this, in these meetings prior that, you know, the officers have discretion if they want to arrest someone or if they want to do whatever. So how, how do you balance the fact that you have specific policies written and there's an expectation that officers will follow that policy, but then you also tell that officer well, you still have discretion to, you know, not follow those policies. And then if something, if he, if they do use discretion and don't follow the policy and something happens within that service call and the OBRD is viewed and they see that violation of policy because the officer used discretion how, how do you balance that? I mean, is the officer disciplined or how do you deal with kind of, you know, that, that, that difference in strict policy and officer discretion? Um, that's a very, um, I guess, drawn out conversation that we could have. <laughs> um, and, and I, it's one that I, okay. Would and I'm open to having, I would say for purposes of the meeting here, be just because, you know, we don't have all night. Um, right. Th the first thing I would get out there is that they, when, when it comes to discretion, we don't want to confuse policy for um, discretionary things. So they don't have discretion on whether they follow policy or not. Um, if they choose to not follow policy, if something is written that says in a particular situation, and you're an officer and you respond to the situation, you will do X. There actually is not discretion on that. That means the department has decided that a particular action is always going to happen in a particular situation that that policy is written for. And so there is no 
discretion on that if they choose not to follow the policy or if they forget to follow the policy or any number of things then then the department will discipline that that action assuming that it's caught um where discretion comes in is in things like certain types of enforcement actions so um you know, I, I can I can go out and I'm a patrol officer and maybe I'm working traffic and I can stop 20 or 30 cars. Um, you know, I stop a car, I take action, then I go stop another car, I take action. Maybe I'm working an intersection or a, a stretch of road. Um, there is no policy that says if you stop a car, you will write that driver a, a citation. There, there's no there's no policy that says that. So the officer has to use discretion on you know, is, are they going to do this? Well, every car is going to get the exact same treatment. And some people, some people will say, yes, that's absolutely the right way to do it. And some people will say, well, no, there's, there's clearly individual cases. Um, Sergeant Hoisington was talking earlier about how, you know, nothing, you kind of get into a job and you realize no, nothing in life is really black and white. And right. so th there are, there are situations where it's appropriate to use discretion. And so um, I think, um, the one area that that I think that we can do better as a department is um, when it comes to discretion is that um, I think that there are minor things that supervisors should have more control over with officers. Um, and, and I say that publicly, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, for example, um, we have a conduct policy that says if an officer, uh, that an officer will show up to work on time with all their equipment. So it's, it's a conduct policy. If you interpret that policy literally and strictly, then then if an officer was 10 minutes late uh, one shift, that supervisor would be mandated to discipline the officer. Um, that doesn't happen, right? I mean, we we all we've all had jobs for years. We all understand, um, you know, uh, that things happen. People, something comes up. Um, so that, that's kind of a an example, but it's it's a it's a good one where. You know, th there needs to be a little bit more discretion on supervisors uh, in some of those areas. But uh, just the overall answer is, is if something is in policy, then, then the officer does not have discretion on it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commander Weber, I'll, you can go ahead with. Uh, your uh, the rest of your presentation. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'm done. I'll let uh, if Sergeant Sims wants to. And I did just send you the numbers. I apologize. I think I just sent them at the beginning of the meeting. But we do we do have some numbers for you um, for data as well. Um, so, right. Thank you, sir. Um, with that, I'll go into the uh, crime statistics uh, for the month of January. Uh, for crimes uh, related to property, for larceny, we had 93, auto burglary, 29, residential burglary, 16, commercial burglary, 65, auto theft, 60, and disturbance, 87. For crimes related to that of person, uh, we had family offense, 210, aggravated assault and battery, 83, robbery, we had 75, homicide, we had two, and criminal sexual penetration, six. Um, and we had a co total call volume for the month of January of 6,914 calls for service. Um, in terms of the force data, uh, for Northeast Area Command, we had two level ones. Uh, we had two level twos for a total of four uses of force uh, for the month of January. And in terms of uh, force, uh, use of force per 1,000 calls, the Northeast was at 0.5. In terms of the makeup of those uses of force throughout the city, uh, family dispute, there were 14 uses of force. Um, disturbance, we had five. Suicide, we had four. Aggravated assault and battery and suspicious persons and vehicles both had three. Auto theft and stolen vehicle found both had two. Wanted person, shoplifting, SWAT, behavioral health, um, armed uh, robbery, commercial, uh, drunk driver, and on-site suspicious uh, person and vehicles each had one. Um, uh, with those numbers in mind, I would stand for any questions that anybody has at this time. So there is one 
question in the chat. Oh, go ahead, Vicki. Oh, I was just going to ask the, the crime data that's on the Northeast Area Command website. Um, it stopped in July. So when when will that be updated? Uh, I'm going to guess soon. I don't I, I can't answer the question right now, but um, we we just finished uh, 2021. So our records division will do their official vetting oh. of the numbers and then they should. And then those numbers that you see on the website will be, be the official ones that are going to report. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't, um, Francine, I just noticed a question in the chat that um, I don't possibly Commander Weber can answer. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, should someone with an act of warrant uh, be pulled over during a traffic stop, does the officer have discretion as to whether or not they will arrest for the outstanding warrant? Um, in terms of warrants, we're actually, our policy is, um, fairly generous when it comes to, um, misdemeanor type stuff. If people, if people have the ability to post a bond, the officer will take them into custody, but the officer can actually drive them to the bonding window and have them pay that whatever the hold is on the warrant and get it we'll get it cleared up for them so they don't actually get booked into jail. So there is some room uh, for moving there. Um, but, you know, obviously it, if the warrant is like a felony or something, then that person is going to go to jail. And that, um, you know, we really, I won't say that officers don't stop people with warrants and then determine that they're not going to make an arrest. Uh, I know that that happens, um, but I would say overall, for the most part, the, the person is going to be arrested on a warrant just because um, if you if you let that person uh, slide, let's say they have a wanted felony warrant and you just let it slide and say, okay, yeah, you promised to go take care of it. Um, and then that person goes and commits a crime. Obviously, you know, we, we have a problem. We had an opportunity to prevent that and we didn't. So we're, we're pretty, um, my expectation is they, you know, we find people with warrants, then, then we either help them resolve it at the bonding window or they go to jail. Thank you. And there is one more question, Roy, um, from Victoria Sanchez. Um, she is asking, um, what is the encampment policy? Um, there actually, we don't have an SOP for APD on encampments. The ACS department, which I mentioned that on the, that it's on the website, they have, um, a whole, uh, family and community services and ACS put out a whole, um, printout on their policy and how they deal with encampments, what their philosophy is, all of that. Um, and you should be able to find that on our website. Okay. Um, this might be a, a good time, Kelly, uh, for us to do our uh, poll. Uh, so if everybody can read it, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it for those who might not be able to. The question is, have you noticed an increase in homelessness in the Northeast Heights? So if all of our viewers could take a moment to respond to this question, we do keep this data. Um, and it helps us in uh, making decisions on speakers and um, getting information regarding an issue out to our public. So far, we've had 13 people respond so far. If those of you who have not uh, responded, if you'll take the next couple of minutes here and um, respond to the survey, we would appreciate it. Okay. Um, it looks like uh, we have, uh, we've had, we have 14 respondents, uh, 13 of the 14 uh respondents indicated that they have seen an increase in homelessness in the northeast heights and uh one person um has uh not 
uh, seen that. So that that that's uh, interesting information and touches on some of the things that we've been speaking about this evening. So thank you for the help on that, Kelly. Uh, sorry about short sighting you on that. Uh, we won't do that again. Okay. Um, next thing on the agenda, uh, Kelly, if, if you could give us a status on um, any of the Northeast Heights uh, CPC recommendations um, that we have, uh, the floor is yours. All right, the Northeast Heights submitted two recommendations. Uh, let me pull up my information. And uh, these were submitted on uh, in January of 22, so just last month. The first one was a recommendation we would like to propose a trial process. 10 cases be reviewed using the entire footage and the same 10 cases reviewed by a separate team for just the duration of the use of force review. Conclusions from these two groups could then be compared to see if there were any significant differences in the conclusions from the uh, two groups. If none or minimal, then there would be justification to going to a shorter review. Reason for recommendation, the major stumbling block for the termination of the CASA agreement and the DOJ oversight is the backlog in the use of, of force investigations, numbering somewhere around 667, as the impetus for the CASA was APD's inappropriate use of force, especially involving individuals with mental illness. The use of force investigations can take at least six hours of field supervisor's time to review the entire footage of that officer's shift, the incident itself may only involve 90 minutes of footage. APD currently is significantly understaffed and being able to reduce officers' time viewing film would both speed up the reviews and improve the availability of officers to patrol the city. Since the goal of the CASA is to investigate and mitigate APD's inappropriate use of force, uh, focusing on the incident for film review would accomplish that goal. APD's reasoning and response, the city has been working with the Department of Justice and the independent monitoring team, whereas the city is proposing a pilot project which includes a streamlined approach to supervisory OBRD viewing requirements, reducing the amount of video footage required to determine if a use of force incident is in or out of policy. While the proposal is not verbatim of the language above, as recommend, recommended by the NECPC, the pilot appears to meet the intent of the request. If there are any other questions, please let me know. So that one was ruled as accepted by the APD. The okay. other, did you want to discuss that or should I move on? Is there any discussion from any of the council on that? It's good that they accepted it, um, I think. Yeah, I'm glad they proposed something like that. That's that's great. We'll see if the, if the um, DOJ accepts it. Yeah. Yeah. Just have to follow up on the pilot plan, yep. the pilot project, and see if it comes to fruition. So we can put it on the agenda next month, Roy, to yes. ask ask a follow up to that to Kelly if you could find out where that pilot request is next month. That's a good idea, Willie. Uh, uh, Francine, could you uh, make a note of that? Uh, Francine and I are carving out uh, things that we specialize in, and uh, Francine, uh, uh, it, she's acting as my brain, uh, which has uh, deteriorated uh, quite a bit over the last uh, couple of years. So thank you, Francine, for keeping me afloat. Um, the next one, Kelly. Okay, the next one involves discipline process to review use of force cases. Uh, the recommendation is the Northeast CPC would like to recommend the review of the disciplinary process regarding use of force investigations where officers are held to disciplinary actions that are not based on the policies at the time of the incident, but at the time of the review. We would like to understand if this information is correct and want to know if it is true the justification of holding officers to policies that were not yet in effect at the time of the incident. 
Reason for recommendation, the NACPC has heard of an issue with the review of use of force cases, giving the backlog of some cases yet to be reviewed or set are several years old. Policies on use of force and other issues have been changed from when they were use of for, when the use of force event occurred. Yet we have heard that the review and any disciplinary actions are not based on the policies at the time of the incident, but at the time of the review. If this is true, this seems inappropriate to us and not consistent with legal standards. The APD response is as follows. In response to your recommendation concerning the review of cases, cases are reviewed under the policies that were in place at the time of the incident. This does not include discipline. As cases go through the discipline review process, cases are reviewed under the guideline, the guidance of discipline policy that was in effect at the time of the incident. Uh, Chief Medina was made aware and the recommendation status is approved uh, probably really more like not applicable because he, they said that they do that anyway. So. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Um, that, um, that, that's good to know. Um, it, and, uh, I, maybe we can do something, uh, to get the word out, uh, because in discussions with officers, um, at our gift bag, handout uh, that we had uh, last year, um, we were getting varying uh, uh, takes on, on, you know, how APD was handling uh, those types of cases. So it's good to know that, that they are using the SOP that was in effect when the uh, infraction occurred. So thank, thank you, Kelly, for helping us with that. You're welcome, Ray. Um, any Council members having discussions, uh, anything, concerns? Well, hearing none, um, does the community have any final issues or concerns before we bring this to a close? If you have any. So, oh, so there I'm was a, a comment. Excuse me, right. There was a comment by one of the community members about the crime statistics being presented. And I think Kelly forwarded that. Do we have um, a comment? I think what she was saying was that when the crime statistics are presented, um, just the plain numbers don't really have a lot of substance to them. And so is there a way that we could have a comparison like, you know, last month it was this, last year it was this, and this month it is, it's this. And, you know, we've had this discussion multiple times. I'm sure Commander Weber is tired of hearing it as far as crime stats go. And so that's why I asked about the update on the web the website because I think that information that she's asking for is actually, you know, it's actually on the website for all the area commands. And and so, prior data and prior data we've seen Vicky has shown the last couple of times has shown the last previous three months and the previous three months, the same three months the year before. So we have seen that. We didn't see it today, but we have seen it. And I absolutely agree with the comment. Yeah. So I did um I've been sending the three month comparison. I did send it this time. So we don't, um, we, we can figure out a way to sort of verbalize what you're looking for, but obviously, you know, to have someone sit there and just sort of say, okay, in, in December of, of 21, we had this. And in January of 22, we had this. And in, you know, G November, we had this. I, if we went through that for every single one of the CADs, remember they're CADs, they're not, um, right. they're not right. true, um, crime numbers. I don't, I think everyone would be asleep by the time Sergeant Sims finished. I, I certainly would be. Um, so I, I just think we, we probably need to talk about what the best way for us to present something, or even if, if we put the slide up on the, yep. the uh, computer, we, we just need to figure out the best way to, to share it with you all. Um, but but yes, I did send the numbers and they are available if you want to. Great. Okay. Do you send them to who, Commander? 
uh, to Roy and to Francine. Okay, good. Because the, the way to do it would be when we get those is to is to put them up on the screen while Sergeant Sims is presenting the numbers so people can see it. But um, right. I'd be I'd, you know, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. That's one of my pet peeves. So if you want, I'd be glad to sit down and talk to you sometime about that. Yeah, yeah. So we can. I think we just put the the slide up and and do it that way next meeting. I think that would be uh, fine. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on real quick, as long as I'm here, is that 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 other recommendation I was going to bring up. We actually just put out a special order um, today or yesterday about if um, we always we always evaluate an officer's discipline case under the policy that was in effect at the time that the alleged infraction occurred. So there isn't there isn't sort of fast forwarding and being like, oh, well, we updated the policy and we now we think the best way to do it is this. And therefore, we're going to go back and judge you based on that. Um, that that is a concern that that anyone would have. Um, so the department always sticks with whatever was in effect at the time. But the one thing that that they've done now is they, they did put out a special order that said um, if the department updates a policy and you you were disciplined for the thing that the department then evaluated later on, and this has happened, um, and we've decided that, hey, you actually weren't wrong. You know, what you did is fine. We've updated the policy to reflect that. We shouldn't make the discipline stand that we issued if we've, if we've decided to update the policy. So the officer now has the opportunity to appeal anything where a policy is updated within six months. So um, certainly I think the chief is trying to recognize the concerns of the officers. Thank okay, you. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, well, that uh, unless anybody has anything else, uh, I believe that uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. I, Willie, uh, do I have a second? Jane, second. thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our viewers this evening. Uh, I, I think this was a very informative uh, meeting, a great presentation. And uh, please bring your neighbors and friends uh, to the next meeting. So without further ado, I, I adjourn this meeting. And uh, thank everybody. Thank you, APD and Kelly. Thank you, Martisa. Uh, thank you for all the support that you give us. Uh, we appreciate it. So everybody have a good evening and we'll see you next time. Good night. Thanks, Roy. Take care. Right, good night. Thanks, Francine. Night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Francine.